This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, my name is Steve Grubb, the past director of GEO Aqua Watch. I guess before we start, I would ask you to um, keep your microphones on mute. Um, we will take questions at the end. Um, alternatively, if you have a question, um, you could put it in the chat and we'll try and address those uh, questions as they come to the end. Um, well, today I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Irini Puliti. Uh, Dr. Puliti specializes in aquatic remote sensing and GIS applications with Brockman Consult, where she's worked since uh, 2020. She's especially involved in water systems products, indicator development, project management, sustainable development, user engagement, product visualizations, and dissemination and promotion of Earth observations. That's quite a list. Um, she earned her bachelor's uh, honors degree in marine science, and her master's in remote sensing, image processing, and applications, and her PhD in remote sensing of lake water quality at the University of, of Dundee. Um, she's previously employed by uh, Automat and Brockman in Switzerland and held several senior postdoc uh, research positions at the University of Dundee and the University um, College Court um, and at the Marine and Renewable Energy Center Environmental Research Institute. She's also held various uh, research positions at academic institutions and worked in the private industry. Um, I've known Irini um, since she was working on her degrees uh, for a number of of years. I consider her a friend and colleague. I've always enjoyed uh, working with her because uh, she brings a lot of energy and she's a positive person and, and, and quite cheerful. Um, so today, along with her long list of uh, co-authors, which I won't read, um, she's going to talk about the Horizon 2020 project um, titled Copernicus Evolution, Research for Harmonized and Transitional Water Observation, uh, CHERTO, uh, the Remote Sensing Products, Indicators, and Prototype. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rini. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. That's a very kind introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, it's good to be here. And um, good morning, afternoon, evening to all, wherever you're located. So as uh, Steve said, I'm Irene Politi, and on behalf of a large uh, consortium for the CERTA project, I'll present what we've done in the past three and a half years. Um, we're funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. The CERTA project um, uh, aims to, to, to develop um, a prototype that to, to, to take Copernicus further um, and uh, with this I'll uh, give you a very brief background of Copernicus in case we have non-European and we do have non-European uh, participants uh, today in the webinar. So Copernicus is the Earth Observation component of the European Union Space Programme. It um, offers six services to its users uh, from climate change to emergency management, you can see them listed on the right of this slide. Three of those um, provide water quality data and information to end users, namely the climate change service, the marine environment monitoring service, and the land monitoring service. Um, however, they, um, they focus on different water bodies. They use different methods and uh, about four years ago when the call came out and our proposal was written, transitional waters were not covered. They are now, however, not, uh, recently um, started being covered by the CMEMS Coastal Service. Um, 
but uh, only partly. So uh, the, the work is still relevant. So the call to which we responded um, was um, asking for projects to undertake research activities in support of cross-cutting applications between Copernicus services. Um, so what you can see here on the graph is what I mentioned earlier in terms of the three Copernicus services providing water quality data, but focusing on different uh, water body types. And um, the, the transitional waters, uh, even though are now partly covered, um, still uh, create the need for a, a more harmonized approach across the different water bodies, across the three services. So CERTO aims to develop the prototype that can be uptaken by the Copernicus services to produce the harmonized EO um, Earth observation water quality products across the water continuum. And um, we put an emphasis on transitional waters uh, because at the time of, of, of the call, um, there was a gap there. Um, we are nine partners uh, scattered around Europe. Uh, we are led by the, the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, who are based in England. But if we go clockwise, we have also PML applications on board and University of Stirling from Scotland. We've got Climate Kick. Uh, who are established in the Netherlands, but have offices uh, in other places in, in Europe as well. I'm from Brockman Consult in Germany. We have Jerry Komar from Romania, the center, the National Center for Research, CNR in Italy, University of Lisbon and the Faculty of Sciences from Portugal, and Hygius from France. And we brought all this team together because um, of the different expertise that they all have so that we could uh, put the puzzle together and create this much needed prototype. So CERTO is a, started as a three-year project. Uh, we kicked off in January 2020 and we at the beginning we were going to finish in December 2022, so last December. But then COVID happened, so we, we were granted a no-cost nine-month extension. So we are finalizing things now, this month. Um, and the aim was to uh, create water quality products to support um, a range of stakeholders, from industry to decision makers, water uh, resource managers, academia, and help nations uh, demonstrate compliance with national and international legislation and targets. So as an example, I'm, I'm showing here the two EU directives um, that, we, that are relevant to this. The, in Europe, we have to report on the status, on the environmental status of our water bodies uh, under the Water Framework Directive or the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. But of course, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are also relevant in terms of water quality um, being relevant to whether we want to protect life underwater for climate action um, to provide, uh, to, to maintain the, the well being of our communities, to provide clean water and sanitation, etc. So we want to, we want it to. Uh, to create this harmonized capability to monitor water quality across the continuum of water bodies from lakes through deltas to coastal waters and the open ocean. And I'll show you how we, we did it. Um, so again, the graph whereby it shows you in, in uh, a visualization of how CERTO is conceived, whereby it's a, it's a bridge across the three Copernicus services providing uh, water quality data um, um, by creating this uh, harmonized capability across all water bodies. So our objectives are to harmonize between the different Copernicus services approaches to develop specific methods which are both in water and atmospheric correction methods for water quality retrieval in transitional waters, which was our main focus in this project. Uh, to develop indicators that are relevant to our different stakeholders. And for that, it was important to interact and consult with, with them throughout the project. 
in the end to provide the prototype system that can be plugged into the services, but also to provide evidence of its value to our end users. So a little bit on the workflow, so that you have the overview of the tasks that we had to do in order to do this. The in situ campaigns that we did under CERTO were necessary to feed the improvements to atmospheric correction and land sea interface corrections that uh, um, we, we want to do, and also to feed into the optical water type characterization. But that was a, a two way process because the optical water type characterization also helped us uh, to inform where we would sample so that we, we maximize the, um, the end membership of the optical water types. Um, all this we can be, I suppose, um, conceived as a, a different pieces of a puzzle that um, are, are part of a processing chain that feeds into the chair to prototype. So uh, one of our partners is a, an expert in, 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 in using the cloud infrastructure to, to, to build the, the back end of what's needed to run a, a processing chain and provide the, the products and also the, the, the front end uh, portal where users can visualize the, the product. And to that, we also have the, a list of indicators that we developed based on um, engagement with the community I've mentioned before, the different types of stakeholders, um, and which are also used to showcase the um, improved uh, water quality effects that we've developed. So to, um, to do all this, we, we chose six uh, study sites and um, as it happens, uh, we have three estuaries on the west, uh, altogether on the west of Europe, the Tegus estuary, the Tamar estuary, and the Elbe estuary in Germany. And on the east, we have the Coronian Lagoon, um, and we focus on the Lithuanian part, the Venice Lagoon in Italy, and the Razelm Sinoi Lagoon system at the Danube Delta in the Romanian part. So the in situ campaigns were a major part uh, of CERTO. However, um, when we, we started the project in January 2020, it was a, a month before the COVID-19 pandemic um, happened. And so at the time when the, the first um, field campaign was going to start, according to our very nice ambitious plan, uh, we all went into lockdown. Oh, well, so the first year sampling campaign had to be cancelled. Um, we were a bit more prepared for the second year. Things were a bit, uh, we were all getting slightly back into normal um, in the second year of the pandemic, learn how to live with it. And we, the second year of the field sampling took place. At the same time, we also asked for the nine month uh, extension that I mentioned earlier. So we could also do um, a, a uh, field campaign in the, in, a, in the following year, in 2022. So the sampling uh, took place in the growing season uh, of its um, case study. What you see on the map, on the maps here, is the six uh, Certo sites and the location of the stations in one of the two years that we sampled them. But the, the number of the stations is the total uh, across the two years. So you see there was a lot of effort in the Danube Delta and Venice, um, a lot of effort in Tamer and Tegus and the Coronian and a bit less in the Elbe. But uh, the important thing is that we had um, different stations between the two years aiming to, to sample in those areas where that were underrepresented so that we can maximize our optical water type um, data set. The data that were collected, uh, and this was um, an effort uh, led by University of Stirling, but uh, with the local partners helping out. We also had two external partners who helped us with the field campaigns, and these are Klaipeda University and the Helmholtz Center in, um, in, uh, in Germany for the Elbe. Um, 
And as you can see here in the list, we collected uh, a lot of uh, parameters from chlorophyll and uh, suspended matter to remote sensing reflectance and uh, aerosol optical thickness, from wind speeds to salinity and uh, temperature. Um, and uh, just to give you an indication of the amount of data that were collected, I'll show you some examples of the numbers. So we collected over those two years uh, across all sites, 502 chlorophyll samples, chlorophyll samples, to which we also had historical uh, samples to add to increase our, our size, our uh, data set size. Uh, and these were more than 33,000. Uh, to the 521 uh, total suspended matter samples, we added more than 1,000 historical TSM samples. And uh, to our 385 remote sensing reflectance measurements, we added more than 52,000 historical remote sensing reflectance measurements, and, and so on. So you, you see that we're talking about a lot of uh, data for training and validation. We use different sensors. Uh, in many cases, these were shift, uh, they were uh, shifted from the UK um, uh, to other parts. Uh, sometimes we used also instruments that partners had. Um, as it was, it, it actually became quite logistically difficult to move instruments around because of Brexit um, from Britain to the rest of Europe. So that was another challenge that we faced next to COVID. At the bottom of the slide, I'm showing some examples of um, a spectra that we collected um, from the left. Uh, you can see the Danube, the Coronian, Tagus, and Elbe examples. And these data are now hosted in the Limnades International Database. This is a bioptical measurement and, and matchup data for remote sensing data that has been um, out there for Oh, I don't remember, seven, eight, maybe more years now. And it contains um, uh, data from uh, many different parts of the world. So it's, it's quite useful to increase one's sample size if they want to. Now, the um, atmospheric correction in transitional waters is something that we also looked at. And it was Hygius who worked on this task. So transitional waters are um, a challenging part, let's say, because, they, um, because of the complex optical water types in there. So we used the in-situ measurements were pivotal to improve water reflectance modeling that we needed for atmospheric correction. But because uh, the transitional sites are obviously located next to land, we also have the adjacency effect that we need to account for. And uh, a lot of them are very shallow, so we also have bathymetry effects. And um, this can be an opportunity as well as a challenge. We can create topography maps of the intertidal zones. It's important to know when um, we have a sediment which is exposed um, and when it is underwater so that we know we are mapping. So we need to characterize and flag the areas impacted by sea bottom visibility uh, on top of this, on top of the intertidal zone mapping. But then the thing I suppose is also that we can estimate a seafloor type and water depth. And this can be, I suppose, byproducts of uh, the atmospheric correction. Here, we have zoomed into the Venice Lagoon over the Burano Island. It's a very touristic little island to go to if you haven't been to. Um, what we can see on the, the top image is a Sentinel-2 MSI image. We can see at the different islands. We can see the navigation channels, or I believe they're navigation channels. And then the turbid water here. On the map below, we see the water depth. So blue color is a deeper one up to 1.5 meters and then uh, in white of course is the, the islands and then things are in between and we also have the seafloor type so we, here we see the sand to vegetation ratio so where the ratio is higher uh, depicted here by yellow green colors we have more sand and where it's uh, the, the ratio is uh, lower we have more vegetation than sand which 
could be, I suppose, an interesting product for some users. And on the right here, uh, moving away from Venice Lagoon into the Elbe estuary, we see the topography map that we, we've created using Sentinel 2 MSI data. And we can see the intertidal zone and the exposed areas during low tide that uh, show up with lighter uh, blue colors. Um, these at, at low tides are exposed and at higher tides are, are covered by water. So that's also important to know so that we know what we are mapping each time. We uh, compared four atmospheric correction algorithms, the polymer, uh, C2RCC, ICOR, and Acolyte. And there was a qualitative analysis whereby we did the visual decorrelation between the water reflectance component at the top and the atmospheric reflectance component, as you see at the bottom. And uh, the, we also validated against in situ data collected uh, during the Certo field campaigns. What you see here at the top are uh, ALTI, at the bottom are MSI, um, uh, sorry, graphs pertaining to MSI uh, data. On the left, we have the mean deviation, which is essentially the bias, and we see that um, the, the, all algorithms have some bias depending on the wavelength. On the right, we have the mean absolute deviation, which is, um, it shows the, the precision of the of the retrieval. So when we compare the Earth observation retrieval and the in situ data, we get the mean of the absolute value of the differences, um, and then we get uh, this graph. So essentially, the lower the number here, the lower the deviation, so the higher the precision. And we can see from these and other results that I'm not showing here that a overall. Polymer is the best performing algorithm, um, um, uh, except for extremely ter turbid waters where Acolyte performed better. Now, this led us to um, an experimental MERGE product for CERTO, whereby we switch between polymer and Acolyte uh, depending on what type of water we have. And um, we have a new version of polymer as part of this uh, CERTO activities version 4.16 for those who use it um, and this has been available for the last few months and it contains improvements related to the complex optical water types that we have and also improvements in terms of the adjacency effects in transitional waters. Moving on to the optical water types. Now, this uh, analysis was fed by the in-situ data, obviously, because uh, of uh, the need for training and validation data. Um, but the, we also did uh, uh, at least twice. So we have version one, I'll show an example here. So we have the optical water type version one that um, um, uh, uh, provided support to the next year's in situ campaigns in terms of identifying uh, locations and conditions of water that were undersampled. So what you see here, we have the Danube Delta, so the Danube River coming out here in the Black Sea. And these are the riverine la lakes and lagoons that are adjacent to the Delta. And the Razelm and Sinoi are the, the, the system, lagoon system that we were studying for CERTO. What you see um, is that um, the Sentinel-2, um, the dominant optical, optical water types in, in this area here, across all data. At the bottom, you see the monthly composites, because we can see that depending on the river discharge, whether it's high or low, we have different mm -hmm. members. Um, these are based on Sentinel-3 data. It's a version one of our optical water types. And now we have version two on the portal. If you get onto it and you see version two, which is um, improved. But you can already see differences here uh, between the, the, the two seasons. I, of course, the optical water types uh, were used to select the best performing algorithms that we now apply to, to derive the water quality products in our case studies. 
So with that, I've explained quite quickly the, the, the bricks that were required to build this processing chain that has now gone into the CERTO prototype. So let me move on to the parallel task, which was to consult with the, the community of stakeholders, understand their needs, um, and inform the development of relevant indicators to them based on those improved um, water quality products that we've produced uh, in the prototype. So in the map in the middle, you see the location of the six CERTO sites. And uh, the lists here show you the, the 18 stakeholders that we started consulting about three and a half years ago at the beginning of the project. And um, we have engaged with throughout because at the beginning we send out questionnaires and we try to understand um, from the, the, the type of sector that they work in, that they're interested in, to the type of um, earth observation based water quality data that they need in terms of special resolution, temporal, as a type of parameter, is it chlorophyll, is it turbidity, is it both, etc. And what you, you can see, I'm not going to read all 18 of them, but I suppose look on the right here on the graph, we see that there are diff different sectors that the 18 engaged stakeholders operate on. Um, it's not one to one, there are stakeholders who operate on more than one sector, with water pollution being, uh, I suppose, the most famous one um, across those 18 stakeholders. Um, other things that came out of these consultations are that almost 60% of our uh, users prefer daily uh, products. And the second favorite is monthly aggregates. In terms of the production time, 60% uh, are interested in uh, near real time information, whereas uh, quite a significant amount as well were interested in historic uh, time series uh, data. In terms of the data format, it's clear that raster files were the winner because every asked user wanted the information to be provided to them as a raster file. And more than 80% were also interested in time series. Um, it's important to, to say, I suppose, that not all users are academic users. So NetCDF files and GeoTIFFs are not uh, maybe a preferred format, and that's quite interesting to see. I uh, visualized the mobile app was also brought up um, because it would be interesting for some users in the field. And so um, the feedback we got at the beginning of the project helped us identify suitable indicators which are relevant to those stakeholders and maybe other stakeholders that we hadn't yet spoken to. So we have uh, simpler indicators up to more common indicators. Simple indicators can be simple statistics like uh, the mean of a water body or the P90. It can be a monthly mean, it can be a five-year mean, depending on what the user needs in order to do their reporting or their monitoring or anything else they want to do. Um, so we've developed um, the statistics for chlorophyll A, and turbidity, and total suspended matter. And uh, of increasing complexity, we also have indicators for planning, zoning, and spatial management users. We have the phytoplankton bloom phenology indicators. And another one is a maximum sediment zone indicator. Um, and in the end, the, of increasing complexity, the most complex um, index that uses several indicators to build on is a vulnerability index called CESVIM. I'll present those in the next few slides. So the planning and management indicators for, uh, let's say, um, the Water Framework Directive reporting that um, authorities do every five years um, um, looks like this. So here we have Sentinel-2 data for the Tegus estuary. Um, and 
heat map uh, shows uh, one month. And I believe, yeah, this is, these are 2022 uh, data. So what we see here um, is that we've aggregated the four reporting regions in the Tegu. So we have the, the, uh, the, the delta here, the estuary here, and the, there are four in October, we can see it better, we have four reporting regions as they are used for the Water Framework Directive reporting. Um, and that's where the, uh, we base our aggregation on. And we, here we have the P90, so the 19th percentile of total suspended matter. This is something that the local user was interested in. And, um, it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to, to do. And it, this can be monthly or uh, any temporal aggregation is possible. This is one of the simpler examples of what we can do with the water quality TSM estimates that we have in Cherto. Then we have the phenology indicators. So based on this approach here by Fer Ferreira and Tal, we identify the main bloom and the main the one that's necessarily of the, uh, the the highest chlorophyll concentrations, but the one that has the um, it takes up the largest area. And uh, sorry, it's not what I'm showing here with the with the mouse. It has the largest uh, area, and uh, we can calculate the bloom duration, the bloom start, the bloom peak, uh, the bloom end, and that's what you see here on the maps on the right. Um, we have the, in terms of the month where they happened in a particular year, we can have the bloom start, when the bloom peaks, and when it ends. In terms of number of weeks, we have the bloom duration, so we can see they can be two or four weeks, and in some cases it can last up to ten weeks here in the yellowish colors. We can also have the number of blooms in that particular year, so as we move downstream, we see we have uh, more blooms. So here in the coastal area, we have up to four blooms in that particular year. And then finally, we have the Vulnerability Assessment Index. So SESV is the Social Ecological System Vulnerability Index. And it was uh, used in CERT to, to, um, as an exemplar of how we can take uh, water quality information that we've uh, produced and use it, combine it with other types of information, both from the Copernic, sorry, other data from Copernicus services, but also model data and socioeconomic data to create this um, uh, index, which is a, a nice overview of the system. And it can give us uh, an idea of the hotspots of vulnerability across um, a region if we apply it to multiple um, sites. So vulnerability assessment has three components, the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And they, these aim to describe the ecological part and the social part. So we are looking at the water body itself, the land around it, so the catchment, the climate, and in terms of the social part, um, which reflects a lot of the adaptive capacity of the of the social system. Um, we're looking at human activities, community descriptors, and then we compile a list of uh, suitable and relevant indicators to um, to build this. So how can we conceptualize this? It's like a pyramid where at the bottom we have the indicators, um, but then aggregated to give us the score components, the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And these components then, the scores of these are aggregated to give us the overall uh, CESV score. If we flip this pyramid to its side, we get this wheel, which is a very common visualization tool for this type of complex uh, indices because um, it's, uh, it's very easy to, to understand and, and, and visualize, much better than the pyramid. So at the outer wheel here, or at the bottom of the pyramid, we have the, um, we selected 18 indicators that were relevant. And that was in consultation with our uh, local um, case study leads and some of the stakeholders that were involved. Then if we aggregate those, we get the, the three component scores. And in the middle, we get the total CESV score per site. 
And if we apply this, we get the data, we extract the data, we apply thresholds. We can use a traffic light uh, system approach whereby light blue is a better status um, than green, moderate, yellow is not so good, and red is kind of a flag, is the more the poorer status, let's say, uh, to, to help us quickly uh, compare across sites. So you can see here uh, which part of the system or which parts of the system um, are more critical uh, that uh, render the system vulnerable. So for example, we've got the Elbe, we've got um, in red here, we see that it has a, a lot of agricultural land in its catchment, which would obviously provide a lot of nutrient loading into the, the water body downstream. Whereas uh, in the Coronian Lagoon, we have um, more than four countries that share the catchment, which would create um, some, um, not necessarily political, but some issues in terms of how to better, how to um, coordinate and manage such a transboundary uh, system, which could cause a, a threat. Um, and finally, uh, most of what I've shown so far goes into the CERTO prototype. There are some um, outputs of uh, the project that we are hoping to commercially exploit. So not everything has been uploaded to the prototype uh, or deployed has been deployed to the prototype uh, and it is not offered open access. But most of what I've shown is. So here is the, let's say, the architecture uh, of the um, of the prototype. I don't understand all of it, but if you look at the top there, we see the different containers where we have the optical water type classifier, we have the algorithms that we use, we have the atmospheric correction, and the other tools that we need so that in the end, alongside other back-end software stuff that I don't know to explain, um, in the end, we get the product. I should say, before I move to the next slide, that architecture is flexible. So because it's using these containers and uh, it can be, it can use any programming language um, and it can be deployed easily on any cloud infrastructure. When we started with the project, we looked at the Copernicus DS systems, uh, but these uh, appear to be now decommissioned. Um, so, uh, uh, it's um, any other cloud infrastructure would also be um, a, a solution for this. So when we deploy this and we run it, the front end is uh, what we get, where we get the data from and where we can visualize our data. And this can be accessed from the URL there and, or the QR code. So we have the portal where we get uh, for those six CERTO case studies, we get the profile, the turbidity, the um, other remote sensing products. And soon those indicators that uh, will be deployed here. Um, I should say that if you scan this QR code on your mobile, it should work, it's mobile friendly, but um, uh, you will either look at the menu or you can hide it using the arrow there so that you can look at the map. It, um, it, it's a lot of information for a mobile, uh, but you can still look at it if you want. Otherwise, uh, feel free to copy the URL here on a, on a laptop. It will look much uh, easier to use. Um, um, in stakeholders that we've been engaging with, we've uh, now that we have to show and demonstrate, we've started talking to other people as well, because maybe more people will be interested, right? So our list of stakeholders has increased, and um, and some have also asked us to add uh, some more sites to the processing chain, and that's what we've done. So we have added Mar Menor, which is a lagoon in Spain, and Etang de To and Etang de Beur in France, pardon the pronunciation, and Lake uh, Vembanant in India, India, sorry. 
And I believe we soon add uh, three deltas. Uh, when I checked today, they weren't there yet, but uh, we haven't finished the project yet. Eh? And we also have Siemens regions because we want to um, to compare the certain data in those uh, four Siemens regions with uh, what the, the Siemens uh, service provides. So um, you'll also find uh, uh, the sites on the on the portal when you get to it. Now, this is my last slide. Um, so as a reminder, CERTO aims to provide harmonized capability to monitor water quality across the water continuum. And our conclusions and some of the lessons learned is that uh, nobody knew uh, about COVID before it started, but the, the lockdown impacted fieldwork by almost two years. And even though we asked, and we were granted a nine-month extension, maybe asking for more, it would have been more uh, beneficial uh, because we did have to rush a bit. Um, the delay was a bit longer than actually nine months. Um, and of course, sampling in the growing season is, um, is important. We, we wouldn't sample uh, um, during the year. Um, Brexit has also increased the logistics of moving instruments across Europe from Britain. Um, apparently, it was very costly, but it required a lot of paperwork as well. So that was also another thing that uh, we hadn't anticipated four years ago. Um, the range of optical water types that we sampled was wide, and it was very helpful. However, we also had to fine tune um, the pan-regional clusters because of uh, local uh, processes take place in the sites and, and, and improve the performance. And spectral data from other areas were important to complement the training and validation data set. I've shown that we also used historical data, right? Indeed, we were looking for one best perform performing algorithm correction, sorry, atmospheric correction algorithm, and uh, we ended up considering this blending approach, um, and that's what we do now. So uh, that's something that came up uh, during the project and that we hadn't considered at the beginning. It, 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 re it, it was important that um, we kept the, the users and the stakeholders engaged throughout the, the project because at the beginning uh, we, we collected the their feedback and information on what they need and then we we develop something and it's now important to um to know that it actually works or whether it needs further um, improvements and, and whether it, it fulfills their needs or not and of course now it's a, a pivotal to bring more people on board and start uh, disseminating our outputs even further and uh, finally, without robust products, we wouldn't be able to create reliable indicators. So the two are interconnected. And it's important that we have these indicators now because we can demonstrate the value of, of the harmonized CERTO uh, water quality products to the community, to the different uh, end users, downstream users, and the Copernic services. And we hope that um, uh, at the end of the project, the prototype can be used. So you can find us on the URL shown at the bottom of this slide. You can email us at comps.certo at pml.ac.uk. And we are also on, it's not Twitter, on X. It's on X. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me today. And I'm happy to answer any questions if I know the answer to those. Thank you very much. OK. <clears throat> well, thank you, Irene. That was a great presentation on a, a, a large project, you know, a multifaceted project. There's a lot of pieces to this. And uh, it's uh, really tackling some of these tough issues in these uh, transitional waters. So um, with that, uh, I applaud you. Um, I see there's a couple questions in the chat, but um, also if you want to ask a question, feel free to maybe raise your hand 
I see down in the lower left corner, there's a hand um, icon there. Um, but we have a couple questions. Um, one, what do you mean by raster files, CSV? Uh, oh, sorry, I thought I was muted. Uh, no, I suppose CSV would be more like a text file. Raster files are the, um, the, the uh, files that we normally use, for example, in GIS, and it, uh, it contains information in uh, pixels. So it's a um, continuous information file that you can visualize easily on a uh, software like QGIS or other. And from that, you can extract the information on a CSV file, of course, but uh, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a different file format. Okay, and uh, Leaf asks, what are the commercial products that you would like to exploit? And is there a viable market for these products? Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, good question. Uh, we had a sustainability workshop uh, one or two weeks ago to discuss this because um, we have the mandate to exploit our results up to four years after this funding, the funding we received for Certo. So we have, um, as I've, I've shown, a, a wide suite of products and we also have byproducts that we had an envisaged producing at the at proposal stage, for example, the bathymetry product and the, the sea bottom uh, type that I've showed uh, as part of the atmospheric correction. These are byproducts that the, the, uh, some of the partners who are involved in Cherto can exploit if they want. So we have mm, three SMEs, so uh, small to medium enterprises. This is private companies of I think it's up to 200 employees is the definition of an SME. Uh, so small private companies who are involved in Certo, and uh, one of them, Hygius, developed those byproducts as part of their atmospheric correction analysis, and they would be keen to, to develop it. And as part of their portfolio, then there is um, a search fee, which couldn't be plugged into the prototype because it requires a lot of, um, let's say, manual um, work and a lot of interaction with the um, local users, uh, a lot of human decisions, let's say. And this is something that we could exploit uh, as part of the of the Brockman Consult portfolio. The um, uh, the uh, how's it called? the maximum uh, sediment load indicator is another. So as part of a water services portfolio, this can nicely fit in and there are uh, various um, uh, entities who, who would pay for those to be, for us to be commercially exploiting them. Of course, in terms of exploitation, we also have the scientific exploitation. We can write papers about those and thus increase our networks and um, get people to know what we're doing and from that build new collaborations and get more uh, funding projects, um, sorry, more funding projects, and do more research and development and uh, develop more what we have or, or new products. So there are two types of exploitation that we are considering for Certo outputs. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Shelly asks, uh, will the presentation be made available for recording? Yes, it will. Um, we will, it will be posted on our uh, the AquaWatch website. Uh, it usually takes a, a couple days um, to get it back. So we do have one hand raised. Uh, I'm seeing the name Elper. Do you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question? Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you for this informative talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is, can you use this product or these products for water bodies which don't have any observation data? In, in theory, yes, you can, because uh, assuming you have sampled um, a, a wide variety of optical water types, 
then the idea behind the optical water type characterization to inform the algorithm that you uh, or the, the algorithms that are best suited for each pixel for, in its particular uh, um, acquisi image acquisition um, depends on the optical signal and uh, in theory uh, you don't need any situation. However, it's always good to have some either local knowledge or some in-situ data to validate uh, this and ensure that it actually works. Uh, because it may be that not all optical water types have been sampled, for example, because though we sampled across six uh, sites in Europe and we've added some more data, to increase our training data set, it may be that we still have unsampled water types. Um, and so it would be recommended that some validation takes place. OK, thank you. Um, let's see if there's other questions out there. I, I see Anna has uh, posted the, the link to our website, which will have the, the webinar um, located. Um, I have one, one or two questions just quickly. Um, you talked about um, some of these shallow areas in the estuaries or close to shore where, um, you know, these are optically shallow waters, and it, which is a particular interest of mine. So, and you talked about them being flagged. So are, are they just, um, you know, flagged and, and deleted from um, the, the data set or the image or are you actually trying to quantify water quality in these optically shallow waters, which, you know, uh, looking at the water quality in the water col column, but still be able to, you know, show the bottom, uh, the bottom materials, if that makes sense? Yeah, I suppose it depends on what the user wants to do with the, the data, because sometimes some, somebody would be interested in masking them out to to only uh, look at the uh, more uh, the deeper waters without the sea bottom um, reflectance, but for other applications, it may be useful to to keep the information in and uh, and look at and look at that. So it's um, it's not. Uh, I, I suppose this is a flag that you can switch on and off depending on what you want to do. Um, um, I don't believe that it happens by default that we necessarily mask them out. I may mm -hmm. be wrong, but I also see that uh, Steve Groom is in the call and maybe he can chip in if I'm saying silly things. But as far as I understand, it's a flag that can be switched on and on depending on the user's needs. Oh, there okay. he is. Hi, Steve. All He's good. Giving you thumbs up. <laughs> So okay, Steve is good. the coordinator of CERTO, I should say. So yes, from PML for those who don't know him, but maybe you do already. Uh, good. Um, and my other kind of follow-up question to that was, so in your experience in looking at this, these databases over the last couple of years, um, do you see a lot of variability? I'm sure you see variability within a site, depending on the season. Um, and variability between these sites. Um, and is it, is it harder, to, is it hard to, um, you know, characterize these sites that uh, might have, you know, orders of magnitude changes, say even over, you know, days or, or weeks? Um, and are there sites that maybe, you know, maybe order, maybe a order for factor 10, they might change? Um, but are, are fairly uniform, probably depending on the watershed and you know upstream water control structures, things like that. As I didn't do this part of the work, I can only view my my guess. So I, I mentioned in the slide that we had to fine tune um, the optical water type clusters. Um, uh, because of to ensure that we can capture uh, local phenomena, like for example, we had in the Danube, and that's what was on the slide, the, the Danube Delta with the Rezelm and Sinoi Lagoon system, where the optical water types changed, although not extremely. It, it went from dark orange to lighter orange. Okay, um, uh, between 
high and low river discharge. Uh, so even though the idea is to, to uh, I suppose, a, a global optical water type data set, it, it, it seems like, or it seemed to me, that fine tuning is was necessary to, to improve it. Um, how difficult it was, I cannot tell because I I didn't do the analysis myself and I haven't uh, looked so closely at the data and the differences between seasons and between um, sites. So I'm I'm sorry, but uh, this is a limited, but as much as best I can give for an answer. You're muted, Steve. I'm sorry. So I have one more question in the chat about, do you have plans for a follow-up project to extend the work on other water, problematic water bodies, in particular the GNC? Um, so um, I suppose as part of the Mediterranean Sea, the GNC would be um, already processed on the turtle portal. Um, the the follow up we 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 don't have currently a to funding confirmed, but we are interested. We like working with each other, and we are interested in working more on this. And we have been looking at calls for the next um, Horizon Europe program, which is the the next program from the Horizon 2020 program that funded Certo. Um, uh, but at the moment, uh, there's no charter to confirm. But I would invite you to get to the portal and look at the Mediterranean uh, a data. I, I imagine the GNC would be covered and, uh, and send us comments, see what you think and see, uh, you know, interact with us because that would be very helpful. Okay, great. Um, Steve Groom, you have your hand up. Did you have something uh, you want to add? Yeah, just, just to add to what Tarini said, what we're hoping is that the results of CERTO will go into the Copernicus services. So um, hopefully then the products for the, uh, the Aegean will be improved by the people who already produce them. So, so, so basically, that's the way in which uh, we hope that uh, this research will continue. And bear in mind that Copernicus, as uh, Irene said, does produce high resolution data around the European coast, and that includes obviously the Mediterranean and the uh, Aegean. So I think that's, uh, that's perhaps one way it's going to continue. We, we haven't got plans, as Irene said, for a CERTO too, but we're always interested in uh, looking at uh, future, future opportunities. Though. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, I think we have time for one more question here. I see in the chat, uh, how much uncertainty in products is allowed for each optical water type? That's from Mini. Oh, great. Well, this, uh, I, I don't know. I'm afraid this is one answer I can, I, I don't want to start guessing, but then Steve has raised his hand. So please go ahead, Steve. <clears throat> okay, um, hopefully you can hear us. Yeah, the, what we do is for each optical water type, we uh, come up with the best performing algorithm. And in doing the uh, selection of the best performing, we have uncertainty metrics uh, for each algorithm per optical water type. So then when we actually uh, classify an individual pixel, uh, it has fuzzy classification, which means it can be partly in one water type and partly in another. And then what we do is assign a per pixel uncertainty based on the statistics um, of the uh, individual optical water types. And so then you can do the same for the uncertainty as well. So if we think that it's 50% uh, one optical water type and 50% of another, then the uncertainty also feeds through as 50% of the uncertainty in one and 50% of the other. So that's how we get the per pixel uncertainty for each uh, each pixel. Okay, thank you, Steve. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, we're gonna have to go ahead and log off. Again, I wanna thank Rini for your 
for your time today and your, your presentation. And um, it was great. And I think we've all learned quite a bit about uh, the Turtle Project and um, some of the amazing work going on there. Um, so with that, uh, again, uh, um, it's, it's good to see uh, so many people online and uh, appreciate your attendance and participation today and look forward to seeing you on, on uh, future webinars. Um, so with that, uh, enjoy the, the rest of your day and hopefully talk to you again soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.